point that I wanted to talk about is the spiking of blood sugar and how that drives oxidative stress. I know within nutrition Twitter, there's been more recent debates around does that, you know, when there's a the growing popularity of continuous glucose monitors and now potentially healthy people, biohackers are now using CGMs to just track their, their diet. And some of the skeptics would argue, hey, there's no data suggesting that for a healthy, metabolically normal person, that glucose spikes are problematic. That's just the normal digestive process. When you have carbohydrate, you of course have a bolus of glucose and you just process it down and it's fine. And then the, another piece of evidence that they would argue would be that if you're eating a low carb diet, you have a, 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 an acute spike of free fatty acid and triglyceride that attenuates as you digest it. So are you trading off uh, a glucose spike for a triglyceride free fatty acid spike? And what is better? This is the kind of argument you get from people who aren't clinicians. And uh, that may sound a little bit disrespectful, but the simple fact is, if you are metabolically healthy, you can undergo oral glucose tolerance test with almost zero deviation of your sugar supply. So to talk about people who are metabolically healthy with extreme glycemic variability is an oxymoron. People who are metabolically healthy don't tend to have that degree of glycemic instability, full stop. So I actually, when we debate about whether it's possible to reverse type 2 diabetes and people say it's only being controlled on a healthy diet, it's not actually being reversed. Nope, that's not true. I've actually done hundreds of glucose tolerance tests with insulin, otherwise more commonly known as a craft test. And I've got multiple patients who have actually been able to restore flat glycemic control in response to a 75 gram load of glucose. Now, uh, number two, we actually have solid evidence from the mitochondrial level that there is oxidative stress that is generated when glucose is a source of fuel. And the greater the flux of glucose, the greater the oxidative stress. Uh, we've got ground level, almost molecular level data confirming that. And then we have experimental data that also shows that. So we actually know that uh, vegetable oils are oxidized. And when you consume them, you actually have these circulating oxidized molecules in the blood that we can measure. We can actually measure the oxidative load after somebody consumes a load of vegetable oil. And then they did a very nice study. They got subjects who were either insulin sensitive, which means their insulin levels worked well and their glucose levels were well controlled, or insulin resistance, which means that their sugar levels were going up and down. And then they gave them the same load of oxidative stress. And they found that there was a huge increase in both the amplitude of oxidative stress in those people who are insulin resistant that persisted for well over 24 hours after one meal of seed oils, oxidized seed oils. And for anybody who's thinking, oh, that's good, I don't have any oxidized seed oils, by definition, if you're having a seed oil, it is oxidized. There's no other way for it. And olive oil doesn't escape either. The reason that these oils oxidized is because they've got these uh, unsaturated bonds. The only difference between a polyunsaturated oil and oleic acid, which forms 70% of olive oil, is that there's only a single bond prone to oxidation olive oil, whereas there's multiple of them in seed oils. So olive oil is too prone to oxidation just to a lesser extent by virtue of having less of these bonds. Saturated fats, by definition, they don't have any of these bonds that are prone to oxidation. So there is absolute clear evidence that this glycemic instability from a mechanism and from subjects who actually are insulin resistant with poorer sugar control, that actually does lead to these much higher levels of oxidative stress. And if you've got these oxidative molecules circulating around your body, have no doubt that they're reacting with some of your liver tissue. They're contributing to worsening your insulin resistance. Again, it's a vicious cycle, as well as uh, potentially interacting with LDL molecules in your blood and damaging them and, and so on and so forth. Got it. And, and so for folks that are making the, uh, the opposite argument where, okay, if you're trading off not eating carbohydrate and therefore you're eating, eating very, very high fat, it's almost a straw man argument where that fat is an oxidized polyunsaturated fat, which uh, it goes back to your thesis that that is or, like bad for insulin resistance anyways. 
But if that was replaced by saturated fats that are not oxidized, that is strictly better than uh, a glucose bolus and a, a polyunsaturated fat bolus that is likely oxidized, right? So it's just a sort of stack ranking, you know, any kind of substrate is going to do some sort of ROS production, right? Like if you eat anything, metabolism happens and there's likely some oxidation, oxidative stress. And we're just stack ranking that uh, saturated fats are least prone to generating extra oxidative stress. Would that be your argument or thesis? Well, yes. And that's not just my thesis. Remember this 2004 paper from the American Journal of Cardiology, where they actually hypothesized that saturated fat would cause oxidative stress in LDL, and they found the opposite. And when they said these experiments provide convincing evidence, our original hypothesis was not correct. I mean, they actually, they've found it, it you know, there's multiple lines of evidence. This is not just a single paper that's been extrapolated here. We've got biological face validity. We've got uh, epidemiological data. We've got experimental data. All the signs are pointing in one direction. Poofers are bad. Polyunsaturated fatty acids are bad. They lead to oxidative stress. I, I think you make a very, very compelling uh, narrative and argument for the case here. But like we still pick up the Cheerios pack and there's still the American Heart Association saying, hey, this Cheerios is heart healthy, even at the face of the papers and the data that you're citing. And I think that, you know, folks like myself and then just the broader ketogenic community, I think is early to seeing and interpreting the data that, the way you're articulating it. You know, what in your estimation is going to actually finally change broader perception? I mean, I, I, I agree with you that the evidence seems to be stacking more and more in terms of how we interpret the world, what's going to finally tip it? Is it an unwinnable battle because there's too much entrenched in interest in big pharma and big food? Is it just that we need to wait for the previous generation of academics to die? And then we take over and just say, hey, like there's this new paradigm to think about. Is it happening now? I feel like, you know, the communities are growing faster than ever, you know? So, you know, what in your estimation finally tips it? Or is it just like, keep fighting the good fight, keep talking about the science and evidence, and then truth will eventually win. The simple fact is we need removal of commercial interest from our food guidelines. People are under the uh, misconception that the dietary guidelines are formulated based on food that's healthy. And that simply is not the fact. There's a whole lot of other commercial interests and lobbying interests that feed into that, including the food that's currently available, the food supply that, you know, if everybody overnight went on a healthy diet, there would be food shortages because there's simply not enough healthy food around. So all of these kind of interests actually play into the advice that the governments around the world give their populations on what to eat. So people should not be under the, the misconception that uh, the dietary guidelines are what is healthy because they're not. They're, they're absolutely not. And if you read the fine print, they say, well, these guidelines apply to people that are healthy. So if we take the American population, there was a national survey that found that based on five markers of metabolic health, only 12% of US adults are healthy. Think about that, 12%. So by definition, the dietary guidelines in America only apply to 12% of the population. I, uh, I find it illogical that anybody recommending an alternate diet could ever be accused of mispractice simply because of the fact that the dietary guidelines don't apply to most people in America. That's a, a nicely point, poignant point there. One thing that, you know, that, that got me thinking about was in terms of the food system and where we've come in terms of like the availability of food is that the modern food system was designed for an 18th, 19th century problem, which is famine. Essentially, a shortage of food was the biggest killers of humans before the modern era. And that's and our solution to that was hyper-processed shelf-stable foods. And oftentimes, the cheapest form of that is very, very high glycemic response carbohydrate. It's very, very stable. You put very, very cheap polyunsaturated seed oil fat in there. It's hyper-palatable, hyper-processed, and very, very stable. You can ship around. You got a lot of calories over in the world. And that did solve famine, right? Like for 99% of the world, there's not a calorie deficit. The problem of starvation today is literally a logistics problem, right? Some political logistic problem where you cannot get to that last mile of delivering some calories to some poor folks 
in, in some region of the world. So while we've solved that problem, I think we opened up a new can of worms, which essentially now we realize that we're putting all of our people into metabolic crisis where we're just delivering like completely the wrong combination of macros and calories to people. Well, I also think that there's something else even more important that we as humanity are slumbering into, and that's the environmental destruction of topsoil, of soil. And the problem with uh, agriculture is that every time you take a plough to soil, you expose trillions of bacteria to the sun, to the wind. We basically denude the soil. There's no surer way to turn soil into dirt than to plough it. And unfortunately, this is a finite resource. And ruminant-based agriculture can actually regenerate soil while ploughing it actually denudes it. And we are going to reach a point where topsoil is completely denuded and we can no longer produce food. If we have no topsoil, it doesn't matter if you're a vegan or a carnivore, there is no food. Now, if you have uh, uh, grazing ruminant animals, they will actually feed on the grass. So the, the grass is uh, converting energy from the sun, photosynthesis into cellulose and providing nutrition, the cow's eating the grass. The cow is then fertilizing it with manure and also with water, with urine. So when people talk about the amount of water that a cow drinks as it being waste, that's completely and utterly illogical because it doesn't stay in the cow. It actually then irrigates the field that they're on. Some of the grass that they're eating, uh, the root system dies and that also contributes to the biomass of soil. And over time, the thickness of soil will actually grow. This is what ruminants do. They actually grow soil. Whereas when you take a plow to it, you destroy soil. And I think this is an important conversation that we ought to be having because soil is a finite resource. And we can talk about what it's doing to human health and so on and so forth. But what happens when the soil runs out? So crop-based agriculture is not necessarily only bad for human health, but it's also can be catastrophic for the environment. And as far as I can see, nobody in politics who's prominent is actually talking about this issue. And this is actually a, a real cause of concern for me because it might not be in our lifetimes, but it's not that far away. I suspect we're going to start seeing problems of the soil being denuded, at least in the next generation. Paul, I'm just nodding my head as you're uh, speaking here because as I'm looking at the data, the nutrient density for our vegetables, our crops are going down every single you know year, every every generation, right? You talk about like you you have really really big tomatoes, but the nutrient density in that tomato is very very thin because of the problem you're describing. Well, we've actually got studies in Australia, so comparing from 1950 to about 1990, and they actually measured crops grown across all nutrients, and some nutrients were down 75 percent literally a quarter of the degree of nutrition in crops now is what they used to be. And this was published in the 1990s, so 30 years ago, So, but it's going to be far, far worse by now. The problem is that food actually takes nutrition out of soil and you don't actually need to replace all the nutrition back into the soil to have a crop necessarily grow. It needs certain nutrients, sure, so it might be deficient in nutrition, but it still looks good, it still grows, it's still green. And this nutrient deficiency is absolutely a huge problem. And uh, that, that's going to affect everybody. And uh, fortunately, with ruminant-based agriculture, then that, that's not depleting the nutrition status of soil. Um, but if you're growing crops, it absolutely does that. A huge problem. Yeah. And thank you for bringing the the data and the exact quantitative results from that. I mean, yeah, that's, that's I think it is actually something that no one thinks about. And I think when people are eating their vegetables or salads, and that this is coming from a factory farmed crop cycle, essentially, they're eating just a lot of water, right? There's like no nutrients in that in that vegetable, especially if they're grown in this style of uh, factory produced uh, agriculture. And this is absolutely, I mean, absolutely huge, because these micronutrients do actually matter. They matter a lot. So if we take one, which is copper, we know that copper has a very important balancing role in terms of oxidative stress that can be caused by iron. Iron is a very reactive molecule. It's essential for good health. But if you have 
not enough copper, then the iron you have can actually become very pro-oxidant. And we see this in a condition called hemochromatosis. So hemochromatosis is a condition where you will genetically just absorb more iron from your diet than you, you, know, you normally would. Now, we used to think about this, and indeed most people do still do think about it as an iron overload condition, but it's not so much an iron overload condition as a nutrient imbalance because when you're absorbing extra iron coming in through these certain transporters, they have a finite capacity, and that means that you're displacing the ability to absorb other nutrients such as zinc and copper, which share the same transporter. So it's not so much an excess in iron that's causing the oxidative damage and the deleterious outcomes we see in hemochromatosis, but a relative deficiency of these other nutrients like copper and zinc, which actually have a, a role in stabilizing the iron molecules. So these micronutrients actually have a hugely important role. And the fact is that when we actually look at the cardiometabolic health of people with hemochromatosis, it's often far, far worse than average. We often see high levels of, extremely high levels of triglycerides.